together. My name is Sharon Fialco. I've been asked by the board to facilitate this meeting. What that means to me is that my job is to make sure that there are as many voices heard as um, deeply and respectfully as possible. So that's my goal. If you feel like I'm not doing that, please um, raise a hand and call me on it. That's what I'm trying to do here. Um, a few logistics to get us started, if anybody needs it. The porty potty is available. Um, another piece is that it's important to me that you're comfortable in this meeting. So if that means that you need to get up and move around or do jumping jacks because you're getting a little chilly, that's fine. Just um, move to the edges to do that so it's not disrupting other people. But please don't feel glued to your seat if you're uncomfortable. Um, what else? What other logistics? We're here from four to six. Well, thank you. We're here from four to six, and so my goal as a facilitator is also to have us end the formal meeting at six. Folks are, of course, welcome. Please stay, stick around, and keep talking if you want to after that. But I'm going to keep us moving along to try to stick to that basic four to six framework. We have Hardwick um, Public Access Television here. Um, if for some reason you are, un well, there are lots of reasons to be uncomfortable speaking in front of a camera. So if you're one of those people, um, you have something that you do want to share, but the camera is turning you off, um, write it down or hand it to somebody else or step off to the side, whisper to somebody else that would be more comfortable speaking in front of the camera. We really do want all voices to be heard, so please don't let this be a barrier. All right? Any other questions or logistics that I'm forgetting? Oh, look at that. There's food. <laughs> so, um, you want to say anything about the food? So there's bread from uh, Elmore Mountain and Patchwork. There's apples from Burt's Water. There's mulled cider. And there will be some soup coming in a bit also. OK. So. Um, this is the basic agenda. <laughs> That's funny, there's just a loose dot there. <laughs> Let me finish that. This is the basic agenda. Um, my guess is that most people are here because you want to talk about and think about and get information about the potential for the co-op to move, which is great. But this is also the annual meeting, which means that it's our opportunity as the owner members to look back at what's happened this past year with the store completely separate from the future possibility of a move. So the first three things are mm, reports to maybe cover some of what's already happened. I'll do question and answer one at a time for each of these sections. If you have questions about what's been presented for either of these things, we can do that. And then this section here, is really going to be focused more on the possibility of the co-op moving to the um, village market space. So um, we have Catherine Bessie who did the um, financial feasibility report for us. She's going to zoom in, come in some technological, not in-person way um, to uh, respond to some of the questions that came up at the earlier information meetings and also be available for more questions as they happen. Um, we have a vision that will be floated by a board member and then really whatever time we have left is dedicated to large group discussion. At the information sessions I split you up but today we're going to stay as a large group. Any questions about the agenda? The outline there? All right. Thank you all. Let's roll. Thank Annie. you. You're welcome. Annie. Board report. Okay. Um, I'm the press, and uh, it's been an uh, interesting year because of um, the leftovers of COVID or the ups and downs of COVID. Um, and any, finan any business has dealt with uh, the ups and downs of how to deal with COVID, but I think we did pretty well as our store, trying to keep people safe. I didn't hear anyone say that they got sick because of being at the co-op. A lot of people said they felt really safe how we dealt with COVID at the co-op. Um, so that makes us feel really good. Um, and that was certainly a big part of the earlier part of this year. Um, our annual meeting last year was on a Zoom, which was our first ever experience. So 
This is lovely to have everybody back in person. It's nice to see smiling faces again, even though some are masked. I know you're smiling under there. <laughs> and, um, um, and the amazing thing about a co-op that some of you know, and we've hung up posters around that talks a little bit about what a co-op is, um, this is democracy in action. You own the store, and this is what it's all about. We're telling you about these things, and best of all, that you get to elect your board members. This year we have a couple of board members that are, um, their term is up, and so they, they have decided that they want to run again for their uh, second term. And if we could have them, where are they? Oh, there's Katrina. Heather's getting her car. And Heather what? Moving her car. Heather's moving her car. I'll, re I'll reintroduce her. Heather Davis is, um, is also a board member re-upping. And she's been our secretary. It's been lovely. Um, and then we have some um, two open slots, and so we have some new board members that are new potential board members that would like to join the board. And, um, and so we have Maya here. Hi, Maya. And um, we have Jacqueline yep, right here. Yes. Um, their bios are on the website, and I think um, a couple other places. Uh, posted around the store and things, or even up here when you come to get your soup. Um, but because they're here in person, I encourage you after the meeting to go talk to them um, and find out more about them and who they are and why they would be awesome board members. Um, and uh, and again, that's what a co-op's all about. You've elected your board to um, help in the um, represent your voice in the running of the store. Here's Heather. Here's Heather. This is a board member that's re-upping. That's where we were in that discussion here. <laughs> um, anyways, I'm really glad everybody's here. I will wrap this up, and um, if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to. Could you tell us how the vote on board members will happen? Um, that's, uh, okay. The voting process um, starts at the annual meeting. We have in-person voting here. We will also have it in the store, starting from when the store opens tomorrow. You will um, give your um, name to the, um, who, the cashier, and they will check you off a list and give you your ballot. If your name's not on the ballot or on the list, it may be because your dues might be due or um, some other technological glitch, and we will try to fix that if that's a problem. But I think we've checked it pretty well. Um, so that's one way, and the other way is online, um, which you go to the co-op website and there will be a whole thing about voting there, um, and that has another way to make sure that you are a member in good standing, i.e. that you've paid your um, annual member dues, um, or your equity, annual, your annual member equity, <laughs> and, um, and does that answer your question? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Great. Any other questions? Then I will move, uh, let Sharon move us on to next. All right. So Bruce is the co-op treasurer, has a finance report. Did you bring any other copies? I didn't bring any other copies. Did you bring any I'm here. I have a copy if someone wants one. So there's a few copies up here if people want to come take a look at them. I am... Um, I'm acting treasurer now. I was not the treasurer last year or the year before or the year before. <laughs> One, the treasurer that we had serving in this position, their term turned out, and that's why there's some new board people up here. But I was a treasurer here for 20 or 25 years before, so I can at least speak or answer any questions to the financial condition of the co-op. 2020 was a very interesting year. Um, we actually made it a great bit more sales last year due to co in the, even in the COVID time being closed down and so much store confusion and how to shop and shopping um, out front and stuff like that. Um, even though sales were up about three and a half percent to about two point eight million dollars, two point two eight million dollars. Um, expenses for labor mostly was up quite a bit, um, and because we did get a forty thousand dollar 
has to basically grant for front workers, for essential workers, essential workers during the time. You know, that money just came into the co-op and went back out to our workers during the, the COVID time. We did, though, secure a $102,000 PPP grant during 2020, but it doesn't really fall until the 2021 numbers. So when you look at last year in 2020, it was actually a loss of $8,000 for the co-op, even though sales was up and the major expense being labor was up, like $115,000. So the co-op had a good year sales-wise, but that's not necessarily a good bottom line number. But because we end up with a $102,000 grant from 2020 that gets carried over into 2021, we're doing great right now. And so all the money that we lost, plus a lot more we've gained back in the first nine months of this year. And sales of this year have been tremendous. We're up about $300,000 for the year. We're up like 20% in sales 2021. <laughs> Food has been going up since the store is reopened and is back open to a normal store. And um, labor is down back to what was the 2019 number. So most of expenses and sales and costs have even back out. But we end up really with a huge windfall due to the PPP loan being turned into a grant. Um, and that is actually a lot of the money that we have available to use in this expansion discussion moving forward. But um, cash-wise, since we've moved to a, um, a equity program, we have been uh, not a dues situation in the last six years. We've accumulated $150,000 savings account, nest egg. So not only do we have $100,000 from the feds, but we have $150,000 of our own nest egg. So we're actually sitting very good with like $245,000 in the bank, something that this co-op has never really has been sitting on. Um, Questions. I have both this year's and last year's, and I actually have some 18 and 19 numbers if you want to compare it to, because 2020 numbers is kind of like crazy. Yes, Stephen? Um, it sounds like this year should be a really good year based on everything you said. So, why in the Can We Do This page does it say that we're supposed to lose $52,000 this year? I don't think any of us sat around last year and thought that we were going to get a $102,000 grant. You know, that kind of like fell out of COVID sky. So if you were to take that money away, we're still at a $70,000 profit this year just because of people coming into the store and buying more. And I, I mean, you sat on the financial committee with me for the last four years. And nowhere did we look at thinking that we were going to have an increase of sales of 20% from that many people moving here maybe from 20 to 21. I don't know. I can help. The numbers for this year in the feasibility study were based on the budget that was created that last year. Looking at this year, and we're exceeding our projections. So, so that's just completely out of date. We did not see it in the tea leaves. I did not see it in the tea leaves. I did not think that coming out of COVID. But the tea leaves are now selling. But have they? I'm surprised that that year zero, in other words, the last year in the existing building, you're showing a loss of 52000 and you know that's not true. It's not true. Okay. It's going to be a profit of probably $70,000. Okay. But last year at this time, going into the last quarter, and you know this because you served the strategy for so long, what we will have as an end of the year in January compared to what we're looking at with one more quarter to go, you know, there's still a lot of expenses to happen. You know, because last year, if I look back in like 18, 19, and 20, we were always up like $8,000, $10,000 going into the fourth quarter. But yet by the time Michael did our taxes, we'd lose $2,000 at the end of the year. So um, there's some expenses to happen this year. But I'm expecting right now a good, healthy profit for, for 2021. So let me interrupt just for a second. We just had two of the most experienced financial brains of the co-op in a little back and forth. Before we move on, I want to make sure, does anybody have any questions about what just happened? Did you all understand enough? No, sorry, it's a serious question. Did you all understand? Were there any questions about that exchange? I yes. I think it would be really good to summarize. It looks like we have 250000 in the bank. Yes. And that it looks like this year we'll be ending with a profit. Correct. So, you know, so I think that's, that's my summary. 
Yeah, that's okay. Sales are up way, expected, way above expected. Yep, this year. sales are up this year, labor costs are down. We have the 250000 in the bank, and then we're expecting a profit at the end of the year. Right. That 250000 in the bank is including present day profit that we're making this first three quarters. Okay. Not an addiction. Not an addiction $50,000 income. Okay. But there also may be a profit in the fourth, fourth quarter. You just Could don't be. know that. And fourth quarters are usually strong for us. Yeah. The holiday sales. I see you, Kate, and then. Judy. Judy, boy, I didn't recognize you under there. And who else had a question? Tell me your name again. Dave. Alan. Alan and Dave. Yep, and did I miss anybody? Okay, of these four people, again, I, I first want to clear up to make sure everybody understood this exchange that happened between our two financial whizzes. Can I just, uh, as long as we're summarizing, yeah. my point is that those of us who are looking at that spreadsheet from the Can We Do This page, looks at, it shows uh, projections for the first year in a new building, first through five years. But it also shows this year zero, which is sort of a comparison with what we're doing now. That number is apparently very, very wrong. Correct. And it would be helpful for people trying to decide whether the move makes sense to be able to have a realistic comparison with what we're doing in the existing building. And the, the numbers there are just wrong. It shows us losing 50000 and we're saying we're going to be with our $70,000 profit. I know that a lot of that is that PPP loan, but it's still wrong. Right, but the purpose here today is the 2020 numbers, because those are done. And we lost $8,000 last year. I don't really, I couldn't even brought up 2021. That's my bad. Well, you did. <laughs> I opened the can. I opened the can. I'll walk in with you. But I'm just as surprised as you are. Because to me, the price of food going up with inflation, I did not expect those numbers. Okay, so. Yeah, and I just got to tell you, Emily just gave me the 1230 today. Emily and Regina and I met. So this is. Hot off the press. <laughs> Hot off the press. Okay. Can I speak just a moment to that? Um, I'm going to put you on the stack if that's okay. That's great. Great. Okay, I've got Kate and then Judy. Okay, so. The PPP loan that became a grant, what is it, what was it directed to be used for? Was payroll. What? It was payroll protection. So we use it in payroll. But now, I'm, I don't really know what we can do with it and what we can't do with it. What I've been told that we cannot do with it is just turn it to retain earnings and give it back to the members. That's, can I ask that question? Okay. Can we just use that as, if that's profit, can that be profit sharing now for 2022? And I've been told we can't do that. Okay, because I'm aware that the government has been, there have been uh, students who got, you know, the COVID, COVID money for, and they're now taking it back from them. Um, so I just want us to be sure that that might not be coming down the road if we're not using it to take specifically for pay. Maybe we can't that, that money has been signed off to us, right? It has. Um, we also expended a tremendous amount of payroll during um, the lockdown. Can everybody hear Regina? Yeah. During the lockdown, Regina, come on up. Um, our payroll increase was tremendous because we were doing curbside shopping. Um, and we spent over $100,000 during that period on payroll. Okay, so, so that we could retain our workers. Okay, but we, we still have 102,000. Yeah. All right, so, so a paper you use it for that, that but that might still came in in the cash register, so it still exists in our coffers. Okay. I just, I'm, I'm just saying because I know that the government yeah. has been changing, the, changing their the deal on, on that money, so I just would want to be totally sure that they don't say, wait, you didn't use that payroll, you just move that into it. Yep. Something else, and that's not okay. Yep. So thank you for bringing up that point, and I'm going to take that as just a point for everybody to check and keep track of going forward. Thank you. Judy. Yeah. Where, Judy. Well, I heard about, you know, the project about the increased sales, but I also know prices have gone up, so I'm wondering, has the volume of products sold increased, or is the increased number just because of the higher prices? No, it's also a volume increase okay. has gone up. Okay. 
Alan, Alan. Um, yeah, the, the 250000 or whatever that's, that's in the bank, is that considered by policy or in the bylaws? Is it considered uh, a reserve fund of some kind? Or is there something else that's considered a reserve fund? Or is it just money in the bank? It's just money, it's number equity money in the bank that by state law, there's some um, limitations of what we can spend or how much money we have to keep in reserve being a co-op. But um, oh, under state law there is? Under state law. And we've been told by Keith, who used to be our treasurer, that was up to like 50% we supposed to have available. So out of that 250, um, you know, maybe 125,000. And what we're looking at doing is not spending that amount of money in our part of the project. So at least 125? It's going to be always staying there. Right. Correct. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Dave. Are we seeing corresponding increases in memberships, equity payments that kind of correlate to the increase in volume? Do we know how the membership plan out of time? Um, I was going to report on that next, but I'm happy to answer it. <laughs> um, well, our, our oh, membership... Wait, wait, wait. So just as an introduction, this is Emily. She's the general manager of the store. Um, <laughs> so our membership is pretty similar to what it was last year. We have about 1,679 members. We have 186 new members from our last meeting. That went down a tiny bit from last year. We had like 220 new members, but it was a little bit bigger time period. And definitely during COVID, when we were doing curbside shopping, we had a few more members join. So I would say our membership is about average. Okay. Um, were there any other, co well, before, can everybody in the back hear what's happening up front? If, if you can't hear, do something dramatic. There are also many seats up in the front. Yeah. And the mic, is the mic? We can make the mic happen. We can make the mic happen. Okay. Thank you, um, Any other questions about the financial report looking at 2020 at this point? Thank you, Mr. Kaufman. <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on. So, oh, here we are. Emily was going to do a general report about the store 2020. Yeah. Yeah. Hello everyone, it's nice to see you here. Can everyone hear me in the back? I can use the microphone yeah. if my voice is too soft. Um, great, I, so my intention today is to look at the last year, 2020, what's happening now, provide some metrics that kind of that connect to our ends and our values, and then talk <coughs> about some initiatives that are happening now and in the future, as well as a little bit of philosophy. Oh, and an update on COVID. Um, so the reason I like to talk about metrics is it's good to look at numbers or things that we're doing to see how are we performing compared to what our ends are and our values are. And one is membership. So last year I told you how many members we had and the number of new members. I just kind of did that one. Also last year I talked about the percentage of local, like local products is really important and our produce department is also a place of a lot of pride. So I reported on like we had 98% non-local, I mean local and 2% non-local. Um, this year, instead of getting into deep into the metrics, I want to talk to you about an initiative that's happening right now that is pretty exciting and, and promoting local products. We did get a grant through USDA and the Vermont Department of Agriculture to promote local products through marketing. So we have several pieces of that that are in play. One is our local label. Since we can't do a PowerPoint today, I printed out a bunch of stuff you can check out when you're getting food. Over there, the green local is our local label. You'll see it throughout the store, so not just in produce, but throughout the entire store. Um, anytime we have local products, we try to highlight that. And then we also created one regional, because I know in produce, uh, Ingrid has been doing a lot of work to not just get, to get local products, but if we can't get local products, what can we get that isn't all the way from California or across the country? So she's been really looking at sourcing regionally. So having that label, the regional label, will help you when you're purchasing especially produce, to know where your stuff is coming from. So that's one piece. We got this local label. You'll see it throughout the store. The other piece is creating new produce labels that make this all a little more clear. And they are just now being worked on. They hopefully be printed in the next few weeks. I have examples up there, and it's fun because like one has a local label, one has a local label and organic label because some of our products have organic practices, but they're not organic certified. Some are organic certified, but they're regional. And then some are organic, but they're from a different country. So the last one is avocados. It shows you the state, uh, the flag from Mexico. So that's one piece, updating our produce labels. 
um, to really highlight our local products, to highlight the organic things, to make it easier to read and find out where stuff comes from. The third piece of it is promoting our local producers. And this grant in particular was is for uh, specialty fruits and berries as well as maple and mushrooms. It's a very defined set of things. So I could we couldn't include dairy, meat, or bread um, in some of the promotion. The local labels we can use forever, but some things made me more specific. So we wanted to create new producer posters showing you pictures of the people in our community that are producing your food. So we selected about eight to ten farms or producers to go take pictures of that fit the grant criteria, and we're going to have posters throughout the store. Two examples of them are up here. They're going to be much larger in a slightly different format. All of these are like in editing phase, but I want to show you what we have so far because I'm excited about this whole initiative. We're also getting marketing help from the folks in the grant to help us market this and market our local products. Um, so I'm really excited about that. The grant itself closes at the end of December, or in December, at what point we have to um, report on how well we did based to our goals. And so at that <coughs> point, I'm happy to share how we did, how this project was going, and what we learned from it. And I also want to give a big shout out to Bevin. She's here somewhere, one of our staff members. Oh, there. <laughs> she helped write the grant that got us the 4000 almost $5,000. She was instrumental in that. Um, thank you, Bevin. And we're really excited to work with uh, Carrie Crozier, who's a member who does design. She's the one who's designing these things, as well as Victoria Zlanowski is a photographer and member who went to take pictures of the farmers and producers. Cool. Yeah, so that's one way we're valuing local products in action is through this project. Um, also, one more note about the producer, the producer posters. We wanted to get folks that were really close to us. In this whole discussion, we were like, do we want to like create different definitions for local and really show you where it comes from? But it got kind of muddled in our communication, and we were advised to just make one label local, but use the posters to highlight the ones that are in our community and close to us. And that's why we have the food in our, from our community tagline. Local itself is now defined by the state of Vermont as within the state of Vermont. So that's what we're using as our definition. Before, we would use New Hampshire and things that were some kind of close, but now Vermont has a, a definition, and we're going with that. So a little more information on that for you. Great. So a couple of things, initiatives from last year that were great at the time but are now phased out is Friends Feeding Friends, where people were donating money and folks who needed help um, getting food could get gift certificates. I have some metrics up there. We had 53 gifts given and 2,000 like gifts given to people, $50 gift certificates, and we got over we got $2,650 from our members to give to folks. Um, the demand for it started to go down, and also Everybody Eats program was really going strong. And Everybody Eats, if you're not aware of it, is where people can sign up and get free meals, um, and that's been really great. It's through the state, and it's with local restaurants where they get. Um, we get money for creating food, and it's CAE has been huge in making that happen. So that's morphed into that. And then we did try um, our bulk space, store next door, or the annex where you could buy bulk things. And last fall, that was really helpful because people were still wanting to buy lots of things in bulk, and it streamlined that. The demand for that also started to go down. I also saw how it was impacting our margins, meaning it was bringing down like our overall income a little bit as well as it got under new ownership and our rent was going to really increase. So it just seemed like a good time to um, be done with that. But we did try that, and I think um, it was beneficial at the time. Um, so there's, those are some initiatives. Great. I want to touch base quickly on COVID protocols. Recently, um, I had a member come to me and ask, like, why, what, what is your stance on masks? I just sent out a survey to staff. Because these kind of decisions I don't want to make on my own. I want the input of the folks that work in the store, and that's their jobs. And so we'll see what the um, results of are for that. I mean, looking at this room, some are in mass, some are not in the store. It, it varies. Um, I've had members come to me expressing a variety of opinions, and we're definitely not united on this, this idea. But um, we'll see what that survey brings up. Um, some things I'm going to morph a little into the move a tiny bit. Well, a philosophy. 
When sometimes when you're looking at a document, and I've been thinking about the mission and vision and value statement, it sometimes it helps to look at it in a different way. And a word cloud can really help with that. A word cloud is where you take a document, you paste it in, and then it will show you visually the words that are used the most. And then the rest are around it. Like, so they're weighted based on number of times of being mentioned. So I made one and printed that up there. And the top two words in our mission and vision and values is food and community. And they were equally top, um, which I thought was interesting. But food for thought, you're welcome to look at it. Um, and then I wanted to say a quick piece about the vote coming up or happening starting today in the board's role. Um, and point out the fact this vote is an essential step of many steps. If we get a yes vote, it doesn't mean that yes, we're definitely moving. Because there's lots of steps that we need to figure out yet. And the board is deliberating and spending a lot of time debating all these different steps. And as facts come up and we learn things, um, so just letting you know, it doesn't definitely mean we're going to vote. There's a lot of steps and hurdles to go through that's natural with any purchase of a large property like that. And from what I see, there's a team of people who are taking their jobs as re uh, representing this group of our community and the co-op very seriously and really deliberating, thinking about it, wondering about the impact on everyone in our community as they make these decisions. So I appreciate all the work that they're doing today. Thank you, Emily. You're welcome. Yeah. Thanks, Emily. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I that? Yeah. the board is your elected representative. So if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us, just like you would do with your, you know, representatives or your, you know, select people or whatever. We're, we're there to represent you. If you want to talk, you know, you want to call me up or send me an email or any of our board members, please feel free to do that. Could everybody hear Annie in the back? Sorry, I left my mask. Okay, just checking. <laughs> um, so, any questions for Emily about her presentation? Please tell me your name. Jan. Jan, thank you, Jan. I'm wondering whether the co-op still has an emphasis on providing food that's been grown with organic practices, or if the emphasis on local is starting to cancel that out, where you would get a, an unorganic local product in in preference to uh, something from farther away that's organically grown? That's a really great question. I don't know if everyone could heard that. She was wondering if there's, a, I'm seeing some yeses in the back. I don't have to reiterate it. Great. Um, so there's a buying policy. It's on our website. You can find it where it has like organic, local, GMO. There's all these re like desires for our products. The reality is not every product can fit all those categories. Um, I don't feel that there's been a preference away from organic towards local. I believe that organic is still very important, but local is also important. And it's, I don't think that, I haven't seen a decision preferring a local product or over organic product happening. They're both very valuable. Um, so it's, it's a tricky place. Maybe buyer can speak that too, trying to, find products that fit all those categories that we value. Uh, yes. Um, this is about the board elections coming up. Can I ask that? Um, let me focus on Emily's first and then we'll, I'll get okay. back to that if that's okay. Sure. Any other questions for Emily based on her report, specifically stuff about last year? Nancy. Is the, the local designation, is that still a hundred miles traveling or, or is that a sustainable, there, there's been different. The state now has a definition of for local that's within the state of Vermont. That's what local is. And if we, like, if we want to use the word local, we have to use that definition now. We could try to come up with another word that would be, show a different designation. But as I said, as we looked into that, it got really muddy and how you present that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I saw a question over here. Yeah, yes. um, Emily, I was just kind of curious about increased volume of food. What kinds of foods are the co-op selling for? Produce is off the charts. Like, I'm amazed at like, how much produce we're selling. Um, and, you know, I thought, you know, we would get to a certain point and, like, that's what we can do, but it's doing really well. And otherwise, the other big department that's up is grocery. Which grocery? is a big department, but um, it's like centers 
aisle stuff as well as frozen and things like that. Other, many departments are up some, but those are the two like remarkable ones. And they're also two of the biggest, so they make a large impact. Just to let you know though, that produce is only 50% of what grocery is, but it's up the same amount, the same $80,000. Yeah. So produce is up about $80,000 and $200,000 the same. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we have time for one more. Could you hear that? Bruce, come back and say it again, please. Louder. Grocery is twice the size of produce. But yet they're both up the same amount. They're both up eighty thousand dollars. So that's what shows you how long. So produce is really up one hundred percent more than grocery is. You mean by square foot? It's this. No, just gross well, sales. Seven hundred thousand dollars worth of grocery so far this year. Three hundred thousand. Last year we did two hundred twenty thousand in produce. We're up eighty thousand dollars in the first nine months of this year in produce. Oh, sorry. produce demand. And to, and to just offset that as a grow, as a commercial grower, I just want to say one thing: the wholesale price is up, and the wholesale price is up no more than about four percent. I know, like over the board, when I sell to you know down country and to the distributors and stuff, so the price is up a little bit, but not the eighty thousand dollars. It's not that. Great. Okay. So this concludes the first section of the meeting, which is. Oh, thank you, Judith. A question about the elections. Yeah, um, uh, it seems for the first time I'm looking at the board as a very important decision making <laughs> thing, and and uh, uh, and we had two board members leave, um, uh, and usually I've seen uh, postings about oh. Uh, you know, vote and and more more in front of my face about this happening, and now it seems to be happening very quickly, um, and I'm just wondering. And I don't know these four people. Yep. So let's take that as a question, perhaps. Of where is the information about the people that are running for the board, and how can people access that easily? There are two places, one on our website and another in the store by the register. It has the profiles of the board members up by the register. Also in that same spot, it had like a call for candidates, which I think I heard in your question too. It was put up, I think, about a month ago um, at the registers. I want to know what their vote is. <laughs> I want to specifically yep. know how they feel about yep. so, the issue uh, in the front of us. Are, there are four people that are running um, for four spots, I believe. One, Raise two, your hands. Up. One, two, three, four. And um, everybody can see you in the back. They will be available at the end of the formal part of the meeting and um, because they're here to talk to folks. So ask them questions now and before you cast your vote sometime in the next two weeks. Yes? Thank yeah, thank you. Paul. If I could ask, as long as board members elect are standing up, whether all the board members present could stand up and at least share their names so people who may not know who they are could so know So can we see the all of the current members? and continuing board members? I'm not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so if you could um, go around, say your name, and your, I don't know, favorite color. Chris Duff. Chris. I'm Heather Davis. Bruce Kaufman. Katrina Rezzianelli. David Luke. Catherine Arnold. Back there. <laughs> and, oh, and David Liu. And Annie Gilliard. <laughs> Good. Good idea. Thank you. Can I just address one issue that Julie brought up about? She thought it was coming fast. We always have an annual meeting in April or so, March, April, for the last 40 years. And because of COVID, we pushed it back. And the reason why maybe it happens fast now, you know, we were planning on having an annual meeting in August, and they got put to September, is that because we could not come to talk to the whole group about this idea of moving until we had this purchase and sales agreement with the people that own the village market to say that we can now bring it to the public. And so because we just signed this agreement, and we have to be four weeks before to warn it. So we warned this meeting four weeks ago, basically the exact same time frame that we've always warned every annual meeting, you know, like a month in advance. 
So there's been no difference. It's just that we've never done it in October. Okay. Maybe that's why it feels kind of yep. out of line. So I'm really excited to say that standing up here, I can see that there are a lot more people that have joined us since we started at 4 o'clock. I'm really glad to see that. I just want to run over, over a couple of logistics. Porta potties over there with a roll of toilet paper if you need it. There's um, hot food and cold water up front. Please be comfortable. Move around the edges if you need to. I hope I was a good model of how in the middle of the meeting you can quietly go around and get something hot to drink to warm your fingers in your belly. Did you notice I did that? <laughs> so that's possible. The food's there for you. Please take advantage. Um, all right. Oh, the other logistical for folks that are just showing up is that we have the Hardwick um, public cable community television. Community television. Thank you. Um, if for some reason you're not comfortable speaking in front of the camera, we still want to hear your voice. So please speak to someone else who might be more comfortable representing or voicing your thoughts and or write them down for somebody else to read. So please don't let this phase you. We want to hear from as many people as want to share. So this, the rest of our meeting, which is an hour and a quarter, We've got really to focus on the possibility of a move. Um, as you all know, there, over starting today and for the next two weeks, there's a vote for the membership about whether the membership wants the co-op to keep pursuing this idea. Um, there, if the co-op membership votes no, then it stops there, or at least it stops there for now. It stops. Um, if the membership votes yes, there are other contingencies that are still in the purchase and sale. So even if the membership votes yes, it's not a guarantee it's going to happen. But before it moves any further, there's got to be a membership vote. Is that accurate, board members? Did I say that correctly? Okay. So, um, is Catherine available? Yeah. Okay. So over some technological wonder, um, <laughs> We're going to have Catherine Bessie available to us, at least by audio. Um, she is one of the, the author, or one of the authors of the financial feasibility study that the board used in their decision to bring this vote to the membership about the possibility of a move. So I believe Catherine has a little presentation. She's also will be available for questions, which we'll take after she's done with her presentation. Correct. Great. That is true. Okay. Yeah. And I haven't been rude during the meeting. I've been like talking to her in the computer. If you've seen me on the computer typing, it's communicating with her. She's heard some of the questions as they come in. And I will let her know it's time to go. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Turn on the volume a little. There we go. Yes. Say something else. Hi. Hi. Um, Hi. Great. So thank you so much for having me here. I hope that the volume is the volume okay? Yes. Okay, great. So I'm Catherine Bessie. I work with the Cooperative Development Institute, and we support cooperative businesses all over the Northeast um, at varying stages of development, including growth and transformation planning, as you all are doing today. Um, we started our work together um, last year, looking at sort of some of. We launched a survey and looked at some market research to get familiar with the co-op and see sort of where you, you all were with this decision. Um, we also um, then turned our attention to the financials and did a deep dive um, with support from the board and uh, with support from our resident CPA as well at CDI to um, look over the scenarios that you may be facing with this move. Um, so I guess the, the high level broad brush strokes that I'd like to share with you all today um, as you head into making this decision are that, well, first and foremost, we're a third party, so we're looking at this um, with open eyes and just trying to see, you know, is this a, a, a good idea on paper um, based on the information and the assumptions we have at hand to make? Um, you know, does this look like it's financially feasible? And our assessment was that. Uh, yes, it does look to be financially feasible, and we've made some recommendations around, specifically around um, methods for, for empowering that even further. Um, and those recommendations are um, a, around a fundraising effort, as well as a uh, 
just general support, um, art, uh, uh, sort of an art, art approach marketing support around the transition. Um, so what I would like to share in particular is that you know, we looked at a 30-mile uh, radius around the co-op. However, uh, most of the respondents who actually took the survey were within a 15-mile radius. And we saw that from the survey, we estimated a market share um, that the co-op is currently getting in the local area grocery of about 4%, which is pretty low. So we saw, fundamentally, lots of room for you to sell more groceries. Uh, capture more of that market share, um, you know, among and within your community. Um, we also saw an upper bound for the uh, Hardwick Village Marketplace um, of about $5.4 million if you were to keep the Buffalo Mountain Food Co-op basket size, um, meaning the amount, the average amount of sales per customer, um, and an average of around $4 million if you were to average what your current basket size is with um, the, the markets and if you were to also average your um, current customer count with the markets. Um, so we saw a lot of favorable trends there and we corroborated this also with a um, five-year P&L projection, profit and loss statement, income and expenses, um, looking at current year, the, looking at 2019, 2020, and sort of setting um, your current financials at zero and projecting out from there. Um, we saw that at sort of a worst case scenario, a very conservative estimate where you maybe took on a little bit of the inventory, but took mostly a loss with the inventory that is part of the purchase and sale agreement with the market. Um, say you ended up selling, in, uh, I mean, um, donating a bunch instead of selling it, um, that it could it could still be financially feasible and get you to a 19 to 20 percent labor margin. Um, this is definitely something the board would like to see be better. Uh, so we also looked at other scenarios, looking at sort of getting us to a 22 to 23 percent labor margin. Um, and we saw that that was uh, also feasible within the bounds of um, taking on more of that inventory potentially um, and, and filling the shelves quicker. Our estimates were based on using, you know, double, less than doubling what you have now and it's triple the space. Um, so we took a very conservative estimate approach to um, slowly filling that space and the more you fill it up more quickly, as I think you have good consultation to do, the better these financial projections will be. Um, we also, I also want to just mention that uh, we have new information now as well around the remodeling costs and the fundraising goals that definitely help the numbers. And I will be working to update all of the projections um, throughout this process as new numbers emerge, working with Emily and um, continuously giving uh, sort of a feedback loop of information to the board. Um, and as we just heard, this year's numbers have, are coming out really promising, which means that our projections are even more conservative. Um, and if we update them with the newest numbers um, and trends are expected to continue, then uh, I do think that that only improves the scenarios that we've tested at this time. And overall, um, I would say you have wiggle room, not a huge amount of wiggle room, but it does appear to be enough wiggle room where if you uh, take this leap, uh, there's many scenarios that suggest that this could work out well, and your worst case is not incredibly intimidating or scary in any way. Uh, it all looks very doable. Um, so that's what we've been able to look at and assess. And yeah, I'm here to answer any questions or support any way I can. And thank you for inviting me to your meeting today. OK, so this is the really juicy stuff, or some of the really juicy stuff. This is the financials 
about this um, MOVE proposal. So, does anyone have questions at this point for Catherine? I'm ready to take that. Any questions about what she said or what she didn't say? Paul and then Judy. Can Catherine hear us? If not, we'll repeat. So mine might end up being a multi-part, and maybe it's for Emily, maybe to relay. Yeah. So in reading the feasibility study, well, let's first say, in my experience, a feasibility study says this could be possible. And then most businesses would develop a plan to execute to achieve that goal. And so I think I'm kind of hearing our speaker talk about evaluating plans based on the feasibility study. So I guess what I'm missing in the online stuff and in what I've heard at the two meetings is the details of that plan. And we've heard a little bit of it here, but when we read the feasibility study, her suggestion, or their suggestion, if it's not her alone, has two items out of six about setting benchmarks for growth, developing strategies, and creating an evaluation schedule. I'd like to hear what those are, and secondly, outline staff development and assess roles and responsibilities. Now those may be things the board is doing, but you're asking, I think, us or me, among others, to vote yes or no. And without hearing how this feasibility study turns into action and how we stay on top of it to achieve the goals, I'm, at this point, I need to get more comfortable about how that's going to happen. So I don't know if that's a question or a comment, but maybe someone could speak to those things from the feasibility sure. study. Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to just start by saying that um, some of those um, recommendations in the report were written before the deep dive into the financials. And so part of what the financials um, analysis became about was setting some of those benchmarks, one of which being the um, break-even point, understanding where you need to be in year one to really truly achieve that the feasibility that's outlined in the financial projections. Uh, and that came in right around 3.9 million, uh, which is still less than, than doubling um, of your current sales, um, as well as getting back to that healthy sales per square foot ratio, um, which we, we suggested if it could be done in the first three years to get um, back into a healthy zone. That would be ideal, and with that break even and the profit and loss, we see that by year two, you're actually heading back into that safe zone, which is the four million in sales, um, and that gets you with the new square footage to a, a healthy sales per square foot ratio. So, although some of those um, metrics are not updated in the actual report, those are metrics that we have discussed and that are part of the financial assessment as well, and available on the. Um, uh, the one pager that I believe is on your website, um, and otherwise I'll I'll hand it to to others to um, respond as well. Um, I'll, and thank you, Catherine. I'll answer a bit to the piece about the plan, or like what's our staff development was one of the questions. Just to reiterate, staff development. What's our plan for reaching these goals? What's the plan moving forward? And the reality is that's still under development. Like, this is a project. We have these goals, we have these ideas what we're going to do, and as we learn more, we revise them and move towards them. I don't have a clear plan to lay out to you, and I'm going to go back to what I said earlier. We're asking for a yes vote now, based on the assumptions is that we continue to move forward, this plan is still feasible, and it's still viable. And at this point in time, we just find, signed that asset and sale agreement four weeks ago, that's a lot of work to get together to be ready right now for this moment. Um, so we don't, ha I can't tell you exactly what the staff development plan is. We don't have that decided yet. Um, great. Okay. Um, I had Judy and Kate, and am I missing anybody else? 
Steve. Okay, Judy. So I heard Catherine talk about getting rid of the current inventory of the village market. And I wasn't able to make the community meetings, but I've seen a lot of concern in the Gazette and elsewhere of the people in the village who shop at the village market that the co-op is unaffordable and doesn't carry what they want. And I'm wondering how that is going to get addressed. Uh, okay. Let me just uh, make sure I, I heard it okay. Is the question about what happens with the HBM inventory? No. It's more about um, meeting the needs of the people that currently shop there. How, if, if the co-op were to move into that space and take over that inventory, how would the co-op continue to meet the needs of the current shoppers at the market? Is that correct? Yeah. Right. Okay. It's the only downtown market for Great. a lot of people who feel they can't afford to go. So, right, yeah. Oh, and so I'll just speak quick and then hand it to Emily to talk about, I think, the more personal um, co-op related side of this. But on one side of this, the on the financial sort of objective side, it is actually in the interest of the feasibility study to sell and continue to sell more of that inventory than to not do so. The worst case scenario. Um, explored what if we did what if we had to buy that inventory and we're not able to um, sell a lot of it ended up donating a lot of it due to it being against what membership agreed or the values of the co-op um, but looking at opening the values of the co-op to that inventory for that exact purpose um, that I think the question asker just brought up of being accessible to uh, members of the community that currently shop there and would lose the potentially lower price items and that might not be organic but might have value um, to somebody. That was all part of our, um, our discussion and our, our assessment and when we checked the worst case scenario we left out a good chunk of the inventory but in some of the other assessments we brought in quite a bit of the inventory to see that it actually does improve the scenario um, and um, I think uh, hopefully that gets you to the question askers question here and Emily probably has a lot more to say on that. I, I, I want to speak to that if I could. Okay, come forward and introduce yourself. Please. I'm David Lute, Vice President of the Board. Um, Our lives are enriched through the responsibilities that we have to each other. And anyone with a family, anyone with friends, long friends, knows this, right? It's being there with each other. We have an opportunity to continue serving the people who live in Hardwick and all the people who shop at that market. And it's really not about the products. It's about shouldering the responsibility of feeding our neighbors. And that's really where I want to center this discussion around this. It's not an empty store over there. It's been operating for 70 years under a bunch of different names, maybe longer. And um, that's what I have to say. Yeah. Thanks. So is it fair for me to summarize or to say that the <coughs> board's working assumption in bringing this vote to the membership is that that uh, that the co-op would expand business to incorporate the folks that have currently been shopping there. That's the board's working assumption. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, Kate, I, I got you guys, really. <laughs> Rose, I'm adding you on too. Uh, so I have... Uh, Kate, and then Steve, and then Rose, and was there anybody else I missed? Okay, Kate. Okay, so the inspection report has not been, is not available to the members, so I would like to comment about that. But I, in terms of the feasibility study, was that information available uh, for making this feasibility study? The and inspection information? The inspection, yes, the, that, and so, 
I'm wondering if those numbers fact in, factor into the feasibility study or whether they even had that available. And I also would like to say that if we members, we need to be able to see those numbers as well and know what, what, what the uh, potential for costs, et cetera, are from the inspection report. I, I guess I'm just saying, I don't know how we can vote yay or nay when that really huge piece of you know the, the numbers is missing. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, Catherine, can you hear that question? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I can hear, hear that for the most part, but there is some feedback through the wind, I believe, online. So I think it's a good question. Yes. Okay. So, um, as far as sharing the inspection report, it's um, it is considered confidential and we have a contract not to share that publicly at this point as long as we don't own the building once we own the building we could share that and i'm sorry we can't because there's you know information in there those numbers from the inspection have been we are constantly incorporating those into that um, feasibility study so as we get updates on, on certain uh, issues that we have to tend to, either in store or renovations we want to do, we have those into the feasibility study. Are they uh, available for us to see? Uh, the feasibility study numbers we can share, right? But, um, you know, not all the numbers, because we haven't finalized everything on the inspection at this point. You know, on what we need to do, we have, we're, we're negotiating with the owners still, so, you know, we don't really even know what those final numbers are going to be. Chris, can you give a ballpark what you're talking about? Yes, yeah, so well, that's, it's really difficult. If we were to make that place shine and look brand new again, it would probably cost close to $200,000. And that's before we did any renovations. Um, not all of that needs to happen. Though. You know, that's, that's really fixing everything that we see that's wrong in the building. Um, yeah, to bring it to code would not take that much at all. So, you know, we're, we're still in negotiations on trying to figure out uh, what part of that we can do, what part of that uh, may be done by the owners. We don't know yet. So it's still, it's still ongoing. I don't know if that helps answer the question. Well, I, I just would like to make point again that I just feel like this is a, re this is a really big issue that is, isn't being included uh, for, for our decision making. You're, you're asking us to vote yes or no, missing. What right. we're asking you to vote on is the numbers that we have at this point, okay? And, we, Chris, and that's stated in the... Let's take that as, as okay. information for people to consider okay. in their vote. Okay? Yes. I think so it's important to respond to that. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Please. I, I do too, actually. Okay, go. Thank we're you. asking in the question if we can spend around a million dollars to do this renovation. I mean, to do this move. That includes purchasing, renovations, repairs. How that breaks out, we don't really know just yet. But we have come up with that round number of a million dollars that it will cost. So I can't really give you the details on whether we're going to replace a bathroom or do this or that just yet. You know, that's all still in negotiations. But we have given you a number to vote on. So. So let me let me add you to the second. Can you tell me your name? Allison. Allison, thank you. Okay, is there anything else for the moment? No. Okay. I've got Steve and then Rose and then Allison. Uh, yeah, this is uh, I guess it's uh, jumping off from what they were saying and the questions about the melding of basically the two populations in hardware and the two um, food inventories. Um, it seems like the feasibility study is requiring that melding for the numbers to work. And I'm just wondering whether the focus groups that were part of the discussion early on, when I was still on the board, one of the things that CDI was talking about doing was having focus groups, not only among the members, but among uh, Hardware Village market shoppers, to see how they would react to the co-op taking it over. And I think there is an assumption that if we carry the same 
products that have always been there, that will erase this cultural divide. And uh, if that's if those focus groups haven't been done, I don't know that it's fair to say that that's the case. So uh, maybe Catherine can say whatever happened in the focus groups. Sure. Um, we did not end up conducting the focus groups um, yet at this time. Um, it's something that's still in discussion, but had um, emphasized putting our work together, the priority towards um, the, the more in-depth financial feasibility assessment. Uh, so that took priority, um, and the focus groups are something that I still think would be a great idea to do. Uh, and I do think that the assumption that there would be um, new members potentially and um, just a, an integration based on this inventory um, staying, you know, there's a lot to consider there. There's a lot of care, there's a lot of marketing. So one thing we really did in the, in the numbers is make sure there was an ample marketing budget for the co-op moving forward so that there would be capacity to uh, support a very intentional effort um, centered around community, centered around um, not just selling this inventory and, and integrating it into the product mix, but also engaging the community around new member opportunities, mem uh, a new member campaign um, to support um, the awareness and understanding that uh, the co-op is a store for everybody. Um, so that definitely is something we've discussed, but no, we have not done the focus groups yet at this time. Do you have a follow-up, Steve? Okay. Um, Rose and then Allison. Um, my question was similar to Steve's, but I guess I just want to reiterate this part of it, which is if it's necessary to gain some of the Hardwick Village shoppers for the feasibility study to work out, then is there any way for us to gauge, or have we gauged, if we will be able to gain any of those shoppers? Like, is there any sense of that? Has any survey happened? I understand the focus groups haven't happened, but what gives us any indication that people will shop at a place called Buffalo Mountain Co-op, even if it's in a different building, if they're not shopping at it now? So, Kathy, so on a, just quickly, I'll say on our survey, we did see that many of the members and non-members um, from a, within a 15-mile radius, somewhere over 600 people within a 15-mile radius, about 30% of folks um, were not even members of, of Buffalo Mountain Co-op, and many people shopped at all of the stores um, in the area as well as Buffalo Mountain Co-op. And we saw that um, Village Market was one of the top ranking it was sort of in the upper well it was, it was middle to top ranking in terms of where people did shop who also took the survey um, so that's that's something I just wanted to point out um, and in in terms of um, thinking just about um, you know, who who are those shoppers um, I wonder if a lot of the people who shop there may already be members or at least shoppers of the co-op based on that information. Okay, Susanna. Um, I just wanted to ask a little bit more about the property inspection report. I mean, is it safe to assume that we can't really hear you? Okay. Allison, could I, you stand up, please? Um, Thank you. I wanted just to ask more about the property inspection report. I mean, I would just assume it's like buying a house, that when when things are identified that need to be fixed, that you, the price gets adjusted, that that's part of the negotiation. Mm -hmm. um, so that it's... So I don't see it as some big worry or some big mystery that, you know, the property inspection report, the results of that will be incorporated into the price and there will be decisions made on what things need to be fixed 
it will be affordable or within the budget proposed. Exactly. Thank you. Susanna, there you are. Susanna. So, I guess I'll stand. Um, I actually have a statement here from a friend of mine who's shopped at the Harvard Village Market her entire life. She's lived in this community her whole life. She says, Hardwick Village Market is the center of our community, the locals, the veterans from the Legion, the people I've known all my life, the senior citizens who remind us of who we are. <coughs> if Hardwick Village Market becomes the co-op, that will be gone. And that would be tragic for us to lose that social aspect all the handshakes, hugs, laughs, and conversations that go on between customers in the store. I guess you can only see or feel it with something other than dollar signs in your eyes. The Hardwood Village Market customers don't go into the co-op now because they feel uncomfortable and unwelcome. I'm sure they won't continue coming to shop at the Hardwick, Hardwick Village Market site if the co-op takes over the store. The butcher's been here his whole life and has been at, and has been at the store for 20 years. He knows what every customer <coughs> wants, their special orders, their requests, everything. He could find a job anywhere. But he said, what about all the people who come here and my relationships with them and their special orders? They would miss him and he would miss them. No one knows them like he does, and he's right. This is more than a business venture or a business mistake. It'll ruin a big part of our town. I'd hate to lose that small town, big heart atmosphere in the town where I grew up. Awesome. Can we let them vote? This is going to affect them. <coughs> yeah. How about we set up some sort of system for the people, the employees, and the people who shop there to vote on this issue? Thank you. Thank you, um, I've got Meredith and then Alan. Alan. And um, before I go back to Alan, are there other folks that have not yet spoken that want to chime in after Meredith? Remind me of your name. Denny. Denny, thank you. Anybody else that hasn't spoken? In your name, please. Jamie. Jamie. And, oh, that would be Maggie. Okay. Anyone else that hasn't spoken yet? Rachel. This is awesome. Anyone else that hasn't spoken yet want to get on my list? At this point, you can get on it later. So, Alan, if you don't mind holding on, I'm going to have these other guy, other folks go first. Um, Meredith. Okay, so many people want to talk that now I'm going to forget what I was going to say. Um, but that's great. So, I this is a combination of a few things. It's a response to both what David said and what Susanna said. So. David's vision is a store that would include all of the people in the population that was represented by the person who wrote the statement that Susanna just read. But the question is, how realistic is that vision given that the given what we just heard from Susanna? And also part of what I wanted to ask is when we're given the numbers and it says it's not even double, you know? It's only like, you know, 85% more business that we need. It's not even double. Like, that's a great thing, but that's a lot of people. We are in a location that doesn't have tons of people coming in and going out. We have a certain amount of people in the area, and what is the name of the person who we're hearing from? Catherine. Catherine, that's what yeah. I thought. Catherine says um, in that survey that they took, this is how I heard what you said, Catherine, it would be good if we knew of those people who are shoppers at multiple stores in the area that includes the village mark. It would be good if we knew if they already shop at the co-op. What if they do? I'm somebody who shops at multiple stores. I am a member. So I can't also be gotten more business out of because I'm already shopping there. That would be a very important number to have. And what I would like to see is, 
I mean, I imagine that the marketing, we have some good marketing. Emily is very good at marketing. She's come in in the last few years. I imagine you've already been pushing your limits of this marketing campaign to get more people shopping at the co-op. Even though it's not in the new building, I'd like to know how that's going, how many, how much increase from what you've already gotten do you feel is possible? And what is the actual plan, David, you might want to speak to this, to achieve the vision of people who don't feel welcome at the Buffalo Mountain Food Co-op? I just want to hear some plans, some ideas, because it's easier said than done, as we all know, who live in neighborhoods with people right across the street, right next door, who don't shop at the co-op right now. And if I said, hey, blank, I won't mention any names, you know, you should come on over because it's going to be great and you'll be able to shop with me and with the other people. I'd already run into him at the other markets. That's not really going to be a selling point for him. <laughs> you know, I'm just saying it's a very complex marketing scheme that you're going to have to do to bring in a whole segment of our town and the neighboring towns who already feel separate from uh, us people who are here right now for so many different reasons that are not revolving around food. They're revolving around education, around where people came from, around military involvement, around family members, around so many different things. So this is not just something I feel that we can easily say, oh, all we have to do is double the, um, or not even double, we don't even have to double the amount of business. You know, I just think it's kind of pie in the sky, naive, even irresponsible to think that this is a realistic vision without some very concrete plans that you can point to other towns who have achieved the same thing. And sorry I'm going on so long, but finally I want to point to the city co-op in Burlington. When they wanted to come into the town, the city government would only allow them if it, be, it was going to serve the same population that could only walk to that grocery store because otherwise there were no other walkable grocery stores. And they agreed, okay, it's going to be the combination grocery store, which is like what we're talking about. And we're going to have Wonder Bread, and we're going to have Hershey's Cocoa, we're going to have all these things that we normally haven't had. And they have them there, but you go in there, you do not see the people who used to walk to the market. I don't know if it was right there or where. You don't see those people, the people that we're talking about that were represented by the letter <coughs> that Susanna read. Anyway, I would like to see concrete plans, ideas, um, um, facts and figures that show it's been done successfully somewhere in Vermont. It's not happening at the Montpelier Co-op, it's not happening at the Brattleboro Co-op. I go to these co-ops when I travel around. It's not happening at the Burlington Co-op. And there are huge or huger populations that they could draw from than there are here in this town. And these are my concerns, my fears, my worries. Thank you. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you. And I want to, um, in terms of, uh, look at my stack, I want to pull out it, um, what were the concrete questions, if any, that you would like some of the folks that have been working on this to answer? Are the, uh, yeah, sure. What's, a, what's a marketing plan to draw in some of the, the other? Marketing plan things. for a diverse shopping customer. Yeah, and why for haven't we, customers. and also, why haven't we, as a co-op community, yeah. already been successful? I know we have right. been wanting to, as a member of the co-op, We've been wanting to bring the veterans into our co-op. So We've been trying. I talk to yeah. other people, they don't come. So what are the things that so what's the, what are the plans that are being thought about and rolled around right now and how are they different, if at all, yes, thank from you. what we've already been yeah. doing to pull yeah. people in? So you asked David specifically, do you want to jump in, David? Well, I don't know, I just thought you might want to, but anyway. Yep. I, 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 
Come for it. Hold on. Okay. I'm Jacqueline Riki. I'm uh, running for the board, but I've been serving interim for a month and month, a month and a half or so. So I'm going to speak first, and then David's going to speak. I'm going to speak briefly. Is that okay, Meredith? Yeah. Okay. I'm really excited by this challenge. I might call it anxiety or nerves, but excitement is also there. And the, the two things that, that spring to my mind in answer to your question, Meredith, um, with the excitement of being able to say there is a plan and there's a way to this loving outcome of unifying. And the first of them is the staff. And I want to just say that I, I appreciate Emily's conservative response about the staffing, that there isn't a plan yet. But I have been working with Emily and talking to her. And in the three or four conversations we've had about the staff, the absolute sentiment and plan and intention that I've heard is that the retention of the market staff is absolutely high priority. And the butcher, Susanna, being there is vital. I agree. And the staff there as a liaison that can cultivate that love and acceptance and this very challenging prospect of unity is one part of that marketing that I think is vital and that we aim to preserve utmost. And the second piece is the location. So what's happening culturally is that by physically moving to that location, we are conceding to a physical condition that is comfortable already, that is in place already. Instead of saying, oh, come over physically to where we want you to come, we are saying, we're here in a non-invasive way. We're here. We welcome you. It's the same people. It's the same place. So those are just two things that spring to mind that I'm inspired by, that that staff is comfortable and familiar and there, and that location is there. And having been in business and dealt with locations and how they work, it's really important where the place is and where the people are used to going. So preserving that, um, I'm given some hope by the fact that it's the same place and the same people that we get to offer. Unlike with City Market or other co-op moves and expansions and things, this is a unique condition of this prospect. Um, David also wants to speak to this. So. Um, and as I appreciate you um, appreciating our marketing as it is now. Yes, we've made some improvements to the website, getting a new logo. Catherine's doing amazing with social media. We've done a lot of great strides. But there's no marketing plan on why produce is up so high. In my opinion, the reason our produce department is doing so well is love. The people that work there love produce, like with their whole hearts. It's prana, it's energy. They care so much about what they do. The whole team, everyone that works in that produce department, it's true. They really give their heart into it. That's not a marketing plan. That's our love that we bring to the work that we do. And as a leader and a manager, that's what I want to see unleashed in people, is loving and having the space to do what they love at work. Um, as far as a plan for the new place, there, I can't tell you the 10 steps to get there, but I can tell you this question of how we get there is the most fascinating to me in all this. I can talk to you about numbers. I can talk to you about local projects. It's all fun. But this question of how we can unite as a uh, community is amazing. And I have to be honest that my heart breaks a little with all the people who think it's not possible, with all the people who are saying things, saying that we can't get there already. Like, I'm seriously going to cry. But I appreciate all your perspectives and opinions. Thank you all. So, um, David, okay. yes, no, do you want to do this part? David was actually on the agenda here. We've sort Judith, of, I see you. We've kind of already, <laughs> what's, um, if you don't have anything, that's okay. Uh, Karen, can I just answer a question on please. the number part that Mary put out? Why we don't think that two to four million of you jumped? In 2018, when we first started looking at this, we were selling $2 million. They were selling $2 million, and Tops was selling $2 million. Mm -hmm. So $6 million of groceries was being bought in the village. And we were doing one third of them. So that's kind of like what we think that like. it's not a youth. To combine everything that the village market is doing now 
Are we doing now to way over four million dollars? Close to five million dollars. We're expecting we're going to lose people in that assumption of three point eight four million dollars. It's less than the combined two. Okay. Jay. Uh, so I. Can I just add one little piece to this? Yep. All right. Yep. So I was on the board in the, you know, through, through most of the 90s as well. And in 1998, we were absolutely convinced that this co-op would never get more than $500,000 with business or 400 members. And what do we have, 1,200 members now? 1,600 members and we're doing two, two plus million dollars worth of business. So I think these, are some, these, these fixed places don't work. We will grow, and it will, it will, we will make this work if we want to. Okay, I, nope, nope, nope. So, <laughs> what I'm going to say, <laughs> sorry Judith, I do have you on here. I just want to be transparent that it's a little bit tricky right now for me as a facilitator to figure out when people are speaking how much they want, they're asking questions and want an answer, and how much is part of a discussion between all the folks that are here. So please um, work with me here, cut me a little slack, but also tell me if you feel like I'm way out of line, okay? <laughs> I'm really not trying to favor anybody. I do want to get to people on the stack, and I also want to respect where I hear some kind of direct questions where there might be direct answers. I hope that's working for folks. So I have um, on the stack, I have Denny and then Jamie, Maggie, Rachel, Allen, and Judith, I got you on there too. Denny. Hi, yeah, um, I'm not a native of Hardwick, but I am pretty much a native of Vermont, living here for the, off and on for the last 68 years, um, I mean, more than 68. Uh, and I've lived in um, three of the towns in Vermont where the co-ops have failed. I've chosen my places. Um, I, uh, I, 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 I'm sure what you're trying for is possible, but whether it's preferable, is a different question altogether. And Subaru has already used the love thing, so that's a hard one. Um, I, I think that my question is, what happens to downtown? Because downtown is what I love and what makes me cry. When I, I shop at the Village Market, I shop at Tops, I shop at Price Chopper, Chop Chop. I, I shop all over, I, I belong to Hunger Mountain, whatever. Um, when I go to the Village Market, I park, I go in, I buy what I want, I get it back in my car, I go home. When I go to the co-op, I park if I can find a place, and I go get my groceries at the co-op, and then I go to Sherry's store, or I go to have a burger, or I do other things in town. And I think that that is really a strong consideration for me. It would be the persuasive consideration for me in voting against <laughs> And I know we're not in the discussion yet, but no, I, what happens to downtown? What happens to downtown yeah. when the village market is there, all the good parking places are there, people go, they get their groceries at the new co-op, whatever, we're all friends, and the downtown remains there, and I don't go there. Thank okay. you. Thank you for your comments, Denny, and also thank you. Let me clarify, we are in the discussion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right? Um, although, if there are specific questions for Catherine, we still have her online here, and we can pull her in as a resource. Um, Jamie. Who's Jamie? Jamie. Hi. So I have a question. If you don't mind standing up, it might be easier to hear I just have a question about the village market. Um, they want to sell. Are they looking just for another grocery people to come in and fulfill that space, or could it be anybody? Yeah. That's a great, it, your question went right to something that I, I wanted to talk about. Um, how long ago was it when we first? It's been like five or six years. They've been trying to retire for five or six years. And um, I don't think we've ever asked Pam and Guy Chris would know a little better than, than I would whether that question has been asked explicitly, you know, as far as like, but, you know, they're grocers. And clearly they're committed to grocering to uh, wait another six years to retire from, you know, when we first talked to them. 
And so it's, it's clearly important to them to feed their community. It's what they do. You know, it's one of the three, the three anchors in this town that are feeding every family, you know, in the surrounding area. And, um, and then I just get to shoehorn the responsibility. And again, it's, um, it's responsibility buying that store. And um, it's one that I welcome, and I invite the rest of you to shoulder that with me. Can I add something to that question? Um, so they wanted to include the inventory that was an optional. So unless someone you know, wanted to manage all that inventory as well as the store, I'm not sure who else. Um, but uh, so that was part of the package was the inventory. Um, Maggie, come forward and speak up. Well, I was one of the students who was yakking in the back row and didn't hear the previous question that might have been my question. <laughs> so it was already rasped, I apologize. <laughs> I heard the answer, but I didn't, didn't anyway. I guess the question, the question I have about the, how long has the market been for sale, up for sale, and if the co-op didn't, doesn't buy it, what happens to it? Is that the question that was Yeah, asked? do we, is there any more information about that? I mean, would there still be a market? Is there any, anyone have more information? I met with, I was myself and Michael and Steve met with Guy and Pam six years ago. They came to us. They own a market. Montpelier Barry in Barry area. They were looking to own another market for their nephew that wanted to get into business. They bought this market six years ago for that family member. After weeks, that family member decided they did not want it. They came to us and said, we don't want to run two stores. You already run a store in town. You already heard so your store is too small for us. So they came to us asking if we would combine the two stores and do that. We looked at it, we realized we were not feasible. The number we offered to them then was without the inventory. Because for us, it was a no-go that we were going to change our inventory. We were interested in the real estate and the real estate only. They said no, they want to keep the market so the people in town would still have the same marketplace to go to. We backed off for three or four years. They put it on the market then on a regular you know, real estate market site. That's when it came back to us to say they haven't sold it yet. And that's when we started to open they are going to keep it going, you know, but they want to retire. It's six years after, they bought it not for themselves, but for another family. And they want to walk away. So Bruce, was it on the market for three or four years and they didn't get any, any yeah, takers? No response. Okay. Uh, Rachel. Rachel. Uh, a couple of things. Did did we did as the club sort of agree to an asking price already for that business? Um, that's one question I had. Um, and would our if we do that move and grow into this position, is our current kind of organization board and administration going to be sufficient to run like this stepped up or um, business? Or are we going to be hiring more managers and, you know, or, you know, building a bigger bureaucracy to manage a much bigger business? Um, and thirdly, and I'm sorry I didn't go to any of the meetings before, um, so sorry if I'm out of the loop there, but um, what, does, does the feasibility consider like a cafe as being a big part of the income? And I remember famously, George reported the cafe was a consistent money loser in the past. I mean, it was a lovely place to go up and, and sit, but uh, it was always understood. I'd always heard that it was um, we lost a lot of money building and maintaining the cafe. So I wonder what um, what the plan is for that. Um, and of course, if we beef up the cafe, you know, it will take away from local business uh, in this town also. So I wonder about. Um, you know, those things, please. Three questions. I can speak to the money things. Ask and price. <laughs> so we did, we did offer them a price um, for the business. 
but there are enough contingencies in there for negotiations that it's hard to say where that will land at this point. Um, but, but we did, with the purchase and sale agreement, we did sign for a certain amount of money, for $750,000. Yeah. That's, that's for the business and the inventory. Oh, so we signed like a yeah. purchase and sale. Yeah. Uh, to speak to your second question, um, in terms of the board, the nine person board, um, I anticipate is sufficient to manage to go from a two million to four million dollar operation. Emily and David did seek out in me somebody with more financial expertise and so we have several of us now with pretty deep financial expertise and so the board uh, powers and bureaucracy and processes shouldn't change much. And then as for staff and management, the exciting part is that we have the experience embedded of both staffs and management. And so between the two of them, no, we do not anticipate uh, expansions beyond the marriage of those two as filling our capacity to do that. And especially in a time when there's staffing shortage in food services of all kinds, the fact that we have the two staffs to marry is very, very beneficial and exciting. And then with the third question. The third question was about cafe. Yes. I'm really excited to speak to this unless you want to. We've been working on this specific question a lot in the last week or two. This has become one of the hot spots because um, in terms of expenses of the uh, potential of the move, the cafe is relevant. And do we have a cafe? How big is the cafe? And how much strategy and management do we put into that cafe that is a potentially very large expense? It's also a very potentially large um, impact on the climate and community within that store and the change of the climate within the store. So I will honestly say that at this point, and I think I missed a piece of your speech, but I think you spoke to this. This is a really moving process. We've had a month since the purchase and sale. We have a month or two more. But part of that process right now is assessing what would the cafe piece be and I'd say that particular piece is a very exciting piece that has not that has a amongst all the different questions that's one of the broader questions the scope I'm holding my hands up here because there's um, the possibility of leaving the deli as it is there's a possibility of building a large cafe that has a huge cultural component of it but the range between that, which will probably land somewhere in between that, is something that we're very much in the process of analyzing, both financially and management-wise. Does that answer your question? Yes, I guess so. But, I mean, it is, it, does, it will, I mean, if that grows, it will impinge on other local businesses in this village. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that's just a reality. So that was, that was why I wanted to know more about it. Well, that is an important consideration, and I appreciate that reminder as we look at the scale of is the cafe kind of just how the deli is, or is the cafe a big new initiative? <coughs> and figuring in there how are we competing with what's here in Hardwick is a great consideration, and I really appreciate it. It makes a lot of sense. Are we adding to it and making Hardwick more of a destination? Because yeah. like it doesn't, one business doesn't necessarily exactly take away from another, but if we draw more people into town, all businesses can thrive a little bit better, theoretically. That um, be so theoretically, that is proven again and again in many towns. If you have one piece of place and other piece of place is worried that when the other competitor comes, they're going to take all the business. No, it's shown that both increase. So I would think that that hopefully would happen. Close, so yeah. close. So, I've been looking right in time. We're at about quarter of. Um, I've now got three people on the stack um, who will be speaking for their second time. So what I, I want to get to them because they've been very patient. And then Charlie, I've got you added. Anybody else that hasn't spoken that wants to get added to the stack? Okay, uh, your name in the back, please. With the. Elizabeth. Oh, great. Hi, Elizabeth. Thank you. <laughs> okay. So um, I've got five speakers and about 15 minutes. Please uh, 
think about your time accordingly. Thank you. So, um, Alan, you've been very patient. Oh, thanks. I hope I didn't forget the, 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 the wonderful comment I was going to make. Um, I, I just want to say that, that um, and Dave, I think, he was very brief, but if I understood him correctly, he was speaking what I'm feeling, which is that the, the cooperative should have an should have an objective of retaining 100% of the current people who patronize the village market. That should be the goal. You know, we should help feed everybody who already is getting fed from there. Um, and, and doing so will, in time, it'll, in, it'll increase the number of members of the co-op. It, it can't help it because people will become more familiar and more comfortable. But the onus is on the co-op to 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 seek that out, to make that number one objective, to please all the people who are already shopping there. Bravo. And and I think that that can be done. And I think it. I think that's that's a that's a um, to to not try to do that, and to just hope that somehow the store that's there will continue to be a store and will feed the people who who go over there to get their food. To to do that and not to not take the chance of of acquiring, merging, and trying to serve the needs of those people is abdicating the responsibility of feeding the community. Because if we don't do it, and we're the community, if we don't do it, who will? We can't count on anyone except ourselves. Thank you. Hey, if I have this time, I have more of a question, answer to Paul's question from earlier. If there's time. Um, thank you, Alan. Judith was sort of answered, uh, I was wondering what's going to happen to our staff that do these beautiful produce uh, paintings and all. Uh, uh, are we going to lose some of our staff when we integrate the other staff? Not on purpose. That's not an intention. But I just like, if you study change management, when change happens, people come and go. I don't like want anyone to go and I'm not trying to force anyone to go. So but that's not going to fire them. That's not the plan, no, no. Um, I expect some turnover just naturally, but not intentionally. Um, Jen, right, Jen. Well, first I have, one quest I have one question of what's been said, and then I have a couple comments I really want to get in. You were talking as though the staff that's already there has agreed to stay on when the co-op takes it over. Have they? Great question. Thank you. I think as per what Emily was stating, um, their jobs are not our business yet, and so we, we don't know so that. we don't know if they'll stay, Whoa. so I'll just... Wait, 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 we met with them. There was information... There was an information from an earlier meeting that I know Emily has that answer. Okay. So we, as soon as we signed that sale agreement, one of the first things we did is make a date and go visit, go talk to their staff, so we could all get to know each other. And I would say at the beginning of the meeting, everyone was nervous and like, we're like, oh, who are you? What's, what are we going to do? At the end, the staff felt better. And I've heard other people come to me saying, oh, I heard that meeting was good. The staff went great. Will some of the folks leave with the transition? Just like I addressed earlier, with transition, some people like change happens. That's not the intention. So and I, I'll just answer one of Paul's question about labor. Yes, I don't have a plan that says we're going to do X, Y, and Z, but we met with the staff. Once we get the vote finalized, I'll meet with people that work there individually. I'll meet with our staff individually. They actually reached out because they could use some help. We might have one of our staff members go start working there a couple of days a week to get to know their staff. So those were like making these steps towards a labor plan. Once there's a design of the building done, then I'll know what labor we need for it. So we're getting there where eventually we'll have it all a plan. Like when I think of a plan, it's a spreadsheet, it's all defined. I don't have that, but I have all the steps ready to go there. And now we have a couple of comments because I guess we are doing discussion as well as everything else. Yep. I personally feel like the move would be a big mistake for a lot of reasons. <laughs> and I feel like the co-op should not try to be all things to all people. Um, I question whether if we take the inventory, there's a lot of inventory there. And to fit the co-op things in there, you're not going to be able to offer people all the products they're used to having. And I've been a part of a lot of co-ops, and I've been a part of co-ops that have failed. I've been a part of co-ops that have tried to expand 
and have collapsed completely and disappeared because of an expansion that was just not able to work. And there was a co-op I was a part of in Tucson, Arizona that was very similar except a little larger than the, the Buffalo Mountain. And you went in and it was wood and natural and everything. And I left and some years later went back and they had moved to a space like the Village Market. Shiny floors, brilliant fluorescence, very few customers because the ambience of what used to be there was completely gone with this new commercial setting. And I personally, knowing a lot of people and having heard a lot, living in Harvard for more than 20 years, what you read about that, I think that that's going to be the feeling of a whole lot of people. And I guess where we are has worked for so many years. And sure, not every single part of it is perfect with parking or whatever, but the people who care about organic food, who care about the kind of atmosphere that that, that particular store has, I don't think that's something that we should lose. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I've got Charlie and Elizabeth. Is there anybody else that hasn't spoken yet that would like to say something before we're done, before we wrap up? Okay. Karen, anybody else? All right. I see you, Steve. Okay. <laughs> Steve, you might get the last word. We'll see. <laughs> so, um, again, because it's my job, and we've got about 10 minutes. When it's your turn to speak, please keep that in mind, that there's 10 minutes for the four people that are left. Charlie. I might have to go. I think it was not that. Okay. Anyways, I want to bring a different perspective in. The co-op has been growing for years and years and years, and the town of Hardwick, too. And from a producer's perspective, it is a big pain in the ass to deliver at the co-op. <laughs> Any other producer would agree with me. And when you have to park way up at the end of one side of the street or the other, and you have to go into a rainstorm or a snowstorm and your product, you know, you want to get to the shelves as nice as possible, it is a big pain. It's, and it's growing worse and worse all the time. I know it's a small, probably, thing for a lot of people in this discussion we've been having. Uh, I just feel passionate about that as a producer. And I'd like to keep producing. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Um, I just wanted to make sure that we didn't miss an opportunity to express the gratitude to all the board and the staff and Emily that have been facilitating all of this and doing all of this research and I just I, I'm there's so much there's so much to say um, and I feel like I feel compelled to all of these different arguments um, but I mostly just feel so grateful for people who are taking on this work and shouldering this responsibility of making this decision mm -hmm. so I just wanted to oh. get it in. Um, I just wanted to bring up the, the point of um, accessibility in the co-op. Um, our um, demographics are aging. <laughs> um, and you know, right now there's just, there's not even room like for someone using a walker to pass someone with a cart in the aisle. There's not room for wheelchairs. You know, if, if someone parks outside, it's really, if, and they, they're in a wheelchair, it's really hard to get out of the car and, you know, they have to get up that curb. It's just, it's really not accessible. And, you know, the village market is accessible. It's, it has wide aisles. There's enough room for wheelchairs. There's enough room even for a scooter. So if we, you know, got money for that. Um, so I just think it, that's a really big consideration to um, make it accessible for everyone. Thank you. Okay, I've got Steve. Uh -huh, Steve and then Bill. 
Yeah, I'm going to and, oh my goodness, and Robin Hood. Okay, Steve, Bill, Robin Hood, is there anybody else? And Leaf, we're like popping out of the corners here. Anyone else? I'm going to take 30 seconds at the end, so don't leave until I'm done. All right? Okay, uh, Steve. Yeah, I'm going to get back to the boring topic of uh, financial feasibility. And I'm curious to know uh, whether the board has consulted with our longtime accountant, uh, Mike Addison, who's been an accountant for at least 20 years, who knows the co-op and its books uh, as well as anybody, and uh, if so, what he thinks of the feasibility study. Michael's no Mike, of course, was not an accountant, he's about taxes, and he's kind of quick on us, and there's somebody else for him. He doesn't feel like he can handle it. You know, we want to go raise money, he doesn't feel like he can deal with that. He doesn't feel like he can deal with the taxes. He's actually no longer going to be. Uh, have you even told him that? I personally have not talked to him about this, and I don't think we've even got it. He's basically told us he can't answer our questions. He's asked us to go see it. Nice elsewhere. Uh, this, this is very different from what I heard from Michael. I talked to him for a couple hours today and yesterday. And um, he was very surprised and somewhat disappointed that you didn't come to ask him what his opinion of it was. But what he told me is that he has absolutely no confidence in the feasibility study. Um, and I don't know if Catherine is still there, but if so, I have a question that she might be able to answer. I am. <laughs> so you may not have anything to do with the um, Can We Do This page on the Buffalo Mountain website, but it does have a section at the bottom with uh, your spreadsheet with some uh, top and bottom line numbers, sales, expenses, uh, net income, uh, cost of goods sold. And uh, I had pointed out in a front porch forum post some errors on this page, and it was far deeper than I even thought. Looking at the net income numbers, they're off. They're, all they are is a, it's a revenue number subtracting COGS, subtracting expenses, and giving you net income. But that bottom line number was off anywhere from 970 to $50,000. Um, unfortunately, this is where people at the co-op are getting a lot of their information. And when I ran that uh, front porch forum post, Emily responded that those errors had been corrected. And it's true, now the numbers do add up on that spreadsheet excerpt. But somehow, mysteriously, $29,000 in sales has been added to each of the first four years at the new store and $49,000 uh, in the last year, which is a strange round number to be added. It's not like uh, you thought that um, sales would increase by another one-tenth of a percent each year, which would give you some weird different number each year. And I thought I would go to the actual feasi financial feasibility study, but the link to that has been taken off the Buffalo Mountain website. So, so see, I, see, I couldn't. I'm sorry, but just yep. because of time, yep. it sounds like you have serious concerns and questions about yes. the feasibility study, and you're also reporting that someone who's been in an accounting role with the co-op also does. I'm hearing, is there a specific question for Catherine about where the, the increased sales came from? Was that the specific question? Because what it did is okay. it turned a loss the first two years into a profit. Yep, so that there have been adjustments to the policy feasibility study, and the question is, what was the basis for those? Adding, adding the increase in sales over the four year. Yeah. Twenty nine thousand. If Catherine can't respond to that, I am able to. Well, let's see. Is she there? I, I can respond. Oh, sorry. I'm hearing some clicking. Um, I'm. I can respond to. First, I'm not sure which scenario is presented at this moment, but I'm sure we can find out. Um, second, I think that the 
several scenarios that were run looked at varying amounts of sales of the inventory. And so the, the changes that were made were specifically around, from scenario to scenario, were specifically around selling more or sort of a, a, uh, selling less of the existing inventory or taking more of a loss on that inventory or not. Um, and so that was the specific question at hand. How much of that HVM inventory will Buffalo Mountain Food Co-op sell in the scenario that you're in that new location? Would it be a very small percentage and then sort of just selling as much as you can and then um, you know slowly adding more and more of the Buffalo Mountain product mix or will it be a continuous um, compromise and continue to sell at the um, margins and the cogs that are from HBM's P&L and balance sheet. Um, and so that is what we explored in those scenarios. And I am, would be willing to connect um, to do a deep dive into those numbers and see if there are other scenarios that we would like to run as well. Okay. We're now about at time. I want to both honor the time that we had and also that there were a few more people to speak. So um, if folks are okay, I want to extend the meeting by five minutes, but really ask people to understand the people that are left to try to respect that time limit. And also I want to encourage people to stay after the formal meeting is over to please keep talking. But I, I want to have an end for the people that came here expecting an end, okay? So I've got um, Bill, Robin, Leaf. Robin. Um, it's great to see everybody. I feel so lucky to be part of a co-op that has so many wonderful people and profound thinkers. And anybody that knows me knows I'm not a numbers person. I don't know about the feasibility study and that kind of thing. And I'm not really sure what's the best idea for us in terms of this move. But I would like to share that um, I remember working at the old co-op not the one over there, but the one over there. And we, um, we used to sell produce through Vermont Produce, and we had iceberg lettuce for 39 cents a head. And local women would come and line up at the door for our iceberg lettuce. And then we went to selling primarily organic lettuce, and they didn't shop there anymore. But I feel like if we have the food that people want to buy at a good price, they will come. And I also remember at the store there, we had uh, we had the gun shop downstairs. We were the home of the Peace Coalition upstairs, and we got along okay. <laughs> we had the liquor store next door, and we sold a lot of salted peanuts. <laughs> I don't feel like we're as um, separate a town as sometimes we're presented as. I think there's much more unanimity in our community than, than we're recognizing. And, you know, co-ops are not that radical, really. There's the Cabot Co-op, there's Washington Electric Co-op. I think it's a great idea. It's people working together that can make a better life for all of us. And I'm hoping that whatever decision we make, that it'll be one that includes all of the parts of our community. So. Thank you. Mm. Thank you. Lee is going to stand in front of his own camera. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure if this has been addressed or not because, you know, I'm just been. Um, anyways, yeah, I feel like integration is a paramount question for me, for everybody. Um, and I wonder how um, not only the staff will be integrated, but the management and the board will be integrated with the Hardwick Village Market because we're doing, um, we're voting on board members now, and that's pre-move. So we're going in with a board that's, you know, coming from this group. Management, same question. Um, it's a comment, I don't know if it's been addressed, but I'm curious about that. 
I, I think it would be very helpful to integrate on those levels to expect to um, integrate the consumers. Any direct responses? Yeah, good. They don't have a board. Their own no, guy and pay And their management is guy and pay Right. And then they have people that work for them. Guy and pay want to retire. So, I don't, so we're going to lose a major piece of their management. Yeah. And but they the don't key have players, it. like the butcher, right. is paramount right. to preserve. Right. for the cultural integration. And that is absolutely but our that's a, I think the that's question, a the question yeah. was about that's the right. decision-making levels of that's right. the co-op. So, because it doesn't sound like there's, is there a direct answer? Yeah. Well, I mean, we have annual elections, right? Like, so every year the board is elected. For members, when terms expire, then there's an election. So, like it was mentioned earlier, it's usually in the spring. So maybe it would be in the spring, but definitely sometime over the course of next year, there would be another election, and anybody would be welcome to run. Any member. Right, <laughs> yes. Right, I just see that as a big piece of this, and, and yeah. not having that going into it, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, that's a concern. Yeah, thank you, Lee. Yeah. So I want to close it up. As the facilitator, I want to thank you all for being as patient, as respectful, and as cold tolerant as you have all been. <laughs> um, and also, apart from being a facilitator, as Sharon, member of a co-op that she loves, I also want to thank you all for being here and sharing your thoughts and your expertise and your hearts, and I hope now back to the facilitator role. I hope that you all um, continue to keep talking about this, keep thinking about it. The voting starts today. If you want to, you may vote in person at this table. Um, or you can go home and vote uh, over the internet by logging onto the web. But it starts today, and it goes until the 24th. After today, in person would be at the store. So in person here or at the store, or um, through the website. Bill. Can I ask some clarification? Yes. Um, nowhere did I see on the website in the voting, was it one person per household or everybody in the household? It's not clear. What do you It depends if you have an individual or family membership, and a family membership is for two people. So if you have more than that in the house, they have to get their own membership, but it depends on your membership type. I think it's set up, the electronic thing is set up to only let you vote as many times as you're allowed. Yeah, and it's going to get double checked, num names against membership type. Thank you all very much. Thank you.